Hello, I'm Rosanna Cambran, and I'm I live in Los Angeles, California. I uh, I am in responsible for membership engagement. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Roberta Wood. Uh, I live in Chicago. I'm the secretary treasurer of the party, and um, glad to be uh, talking with all of you this evening. I'm Diane Mone. I live in Salem, Massachusetts. I'm on the national committee of the party and part of the Boston Club of the Communist Party. Okay, you have a, a bright light uh, shining right on you, so you look yellow. So. <laughs> Okay, that were. Is that better? I think it's the hall. Right? That, no, it's not. No, okay. it's too dark. How's that? That's that. That's that's okay. Okay. All right. So, that I propose that we begin that we uh that we uh use this format that we have each of you make your presentations, and then uh we open the floor for uh, uh comments and questions. And we might want to start with uh, you, uh, Di uh, we might want to start with you, uh, Roberta, and then go to Diane, and then go to Rosanna. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, see, I turned my light down, now I can't read my notes. Uh, but uh, I wanted to uh, start with just saying a word about socialism. We're talking about women and socialism. and. Um, you know, socialism isn't just a great idea that um, Marx and Engels happened to think up, <clears throat> but really, um, since people were capable of dreaming of, of a different kind of life than they currently led, ever since people could dream, they've always dreamed of an idea of a society that was just and where people could be treated equally, and most of all, where there would be enough for everyone. <clears throat> but it only became possible to realize uh, this dream when science and technology um, made it possible to imagine that there could be enough for everyone. Um, and this came about only recently in human history when the, uh, with a huge leap in productivity of humans that took place starting, I think, in the mid 1800s with the Industrial Revolution. And it, that's the point where science and technology, and it, this is a technology based on people working together, working socially, not working as individuals on each little farm plot, but where people working socially um, could have this huge leap in productivity. Um, and this happened first in factories, and um, now we even have a worldwide uh, division of labor. So the, this dream um, went from being a, a dream to a, you know, something that could be possible. When people work together to produce, the logic is that they should own the, the tools that they use for this great productivity. That would be the factories and today the technology and the software and um, control how those things are used so they can own the products and decide how those, you know, are also distributed. And we know under capitalism, um, we have all of these prerequisites in our country for this beautiful life of equality and enough for everyone. We have everything except um, the, the, the social ownership of, of these tools of productivity. I was think, trying to think of a modern example. Um, we always talk about factories, but how about talking about Uber? You know, Uber is basically a techno technicians and uh, and engineers developed software and the millions of drivers around the world are doing the job and their product is rides. It's a very necessary thing for society. But the drivers and the technicians have no control over how this is used and of the work and very little of the profits. So um, getting to women, I think the question of the conditions of work are especially um, pressing for women. Um, not only the things that we think of like health and safety and you know hours of work, but um, as we produce women, we're at the same time in our lives, we're raising the next generation and issues like long hours and irregular hours um, and other things put special burdens on women. So the driving force um, uh, in, um, 
for socialism is the, or for the possibility of socialism is the social nature of production. And I think it's not a coincidence that in the century and a half of the industrial revolution, that's when we've seen the rise of the class struggle. It's not a coincidence that there's been a parallel development um, of the amazing struggles in the fight for the equality of women, because women have been unequal and especially oppressed for as long as of, of written human history. Um, and so the, part of this class struggle, not a small part, is a struggle for a full half of the working class to throw off the burdens that have dehumanized and disarmed them um, on top of being part of the working class. So, you know, Marx said capitalism creates its own grave diggers. And I guess we all have a picture of a grave digger, but um, I think our picture of a grave digger, of grave diggers of capitalism, has to be uh, people, a non traditional job of women. And I think we need to see women are part of that. Um, so um, when uh, a, <clears throat> so capitalism um, has played a, a critical has a critical force has been to uh, pull women or force women into the workforce, and not only always under the most uh, good or likable conditions. Um, women were horribly um, exploited and overworked and paid even less than men. Um, but before women joined the workforce, traditionally um, political discussions always referred to women as backward. We don't remember that now, but I reading things in the days of the Russian Revolution and so on, women were considered a backward force. Why? Because they were isolated. They were under the deep influence of reactionary religious leaders and superstition. They were isolated from public conversation and uneducated. So moving into the workplace allowed girls and women to meet people of other uh, nationalities and from other places, to learn about organization, to take part in public discussions of issues of the day, to become political, and to become working class intellectuals. Um, and I think it's interesting in the United States that the groups of women who were especially forced into the workforce, starting with African American women, but also many immigrant women, Jewish women, farm worker women, that these same women, um, these same groups also um, reflected a leadership in the whole working class struggle, um, reflecting how participation in the workforce has moved women uh, to be uh, leaders in that. Now, in countries where socialism, uh, where socialist revolutions took place um, by for uh, various historical reasons, were not places mostly where women were a big part of the workforce to begin with. These were countries that were um, not, not highly developed industrially, and so women did suffer a lot of this isolation and not being part of the workforce. After these socialist oriented revolutions, the women were quickly drawn into the workforce. And so I'm thinking of countries like the Soviet Union, um, Vietnam, uh, to a certain extent, Cuba. There were two reasons why the, after socialist revolutions, women were quickly uh, pulled into the workforce. One was, um, I think that, you know, ideological, the willingness to take on the uh, you know, to fight for women's equality. But secondly, and maybe more pressing, the need to grow production. So every worker was needed. And so it was important for women to, to, to grow the workforce. Um, and so we've seen in all of these uh, socialist countries, a corresponding development of families supporting social services. And I, you're gonna hear me say this a few times, especially childcare. Um, because um, even though <clears throat> contrasted to our country where almost half of the workforce is women, we have no, I would say we have no system of childcare. <laughs> you know, we have no social system. Um, and uh, I think it's because capitalism can't figure out a way to make it very profitable. You know, industries that um, are inherently unprofitable like you know, high quality childcare are not developed, but socialism 
allows for the people to make a decision to invest in a, a in an industry that isn't inherently profitable, but that's necessary. And so um, I think that one of the great achievements of socialist societies in every country where uh, it's been built has been the development of high quality uh, childcare systems that benefits not only the children, but also takes an enormous burden off of uh, working women. Nevertheless, and, and the other social, uh, other supportive uh, services also developed in different countries. But I think, um, nevertheless, uh, there was always a persistent earning gap, I'm thinking of the Soviet Union, between men and women, and also a persistent uh, def <clears throat> uh, difference of what jobs that all jobs weren't equally distributed. So um, where women were w welcomed into the professions like uh, engineering and medicine, still the highest um, jobs in the leading posts were occupied by men. Now, I think we have to go back and say that these were not countries that had a strong history of working women's movements for the reasons we talked about that um, women weren't a big part of the workforce. And it was necessary when, after socialism was established to actually start women's organizations to try to build up this kind of civic engagement and participation. But the, <clears throat> the socialist, uh, but it wasn't built on that heritage. And it's not clear to me if even what women wanted was to have the same jobs as men have. I'm, I think it's kind of a funny uh, experience I saw when I went to Cuba in 19, in the 1970s and with a group of women who were from the United States who were very dismayed at the um, all the pressure that was put on us as young, <clears throat> young women to look beautiful and to consume beauty products and so on. So when we went to a factory where there were women and we thought, what were they doing for the women? They were putting in a beauty shop, you know, and we were horrified by that, but that was what the women there wanted. And so I think we have to also be, you know, they had never had access to, to these kind of services and it was something good for them. And so we have to say that we don't have a blueprint of what socialism will mean for women. It has to be what the women, what we ourselves decide. Um, so, um, what would socialism mean for um, for women in the United States? Well, that's up to us. And um, for me, as a woman in the United States, I would have to say that it would make life human for us because of this social investment starting in childcare, but not only that we're all um, sad, <laughs> that our children and our grandchildren aren't getting everything that society could possibly offer. So starting with an investment in childcare, but summer camps and integrated with after school care, transportation to art and culture and everything beautiful that life ha has to offer, but also things like on-site healthcare and dental care and special help for special needs children. That, um, all of these things that none of us feel we can provide, but we want. Um, and uh, so that's just an example of things that I think we would look for. But also other household services like in industrial cleaning, uh, laundries, meal preparation. And I think in a socialist society, we would see much shorter hours. And um, the but getting to, down to the conditions of work, I think many women who work in jobs that are traditionally held by women are happy to do those jobs. The problem is, you know, their caregiving jobs, whether it's a service industry, health care, child care, the problem is these jobs are not professionalized. They should be have access to training to do the very best professional job you could do. And of course, to be paid commensurate with the value of that work so that all of these jobs that are considered, uh, you know, throwaway jobs would become jobs with a high level of dignity and, and training. Um, we have a situation here in the United States that 
no women who lived in a socialist oriented, uh, after a socialist oriented revolution have had, because we live in a society where there is uh, plenty for everyone and plenty to do all of the beautiful things for our families and ourselves that we want, we could design a future uh, where all this happened. So um, part of that figuring out isn't just daydreaming about it, but also fighting for some of the um, issues that um, that are hitting us right now. And uh, there's, of course, a tremendous movement about against sexual harassment, um, a movement against a, a movement um, for uh, reproductive rights and, and so on. But I think that we also need to think about the things that we envision in the society we would like to live in and start to fight for some of those because these are the same women who are gonna be fighting to build socialism in the future. And we need to think about um, what it is that's important to us. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Roberta. If we could go right to Diane and then following Diane Rosanna. Hi, good evening. Um, women under health, women in uh, healthcare and socialism, um, under capitalism, as we have in the United States, healthcare is a means of maintaining a workforce healthy enough to be able to work and produce goods and services and profits for employers. Any access to the to the right to health care has been forced from uh, industry and banking science, other, in other words, the ruling class, uh, things like uh, health insurance, um, uh, public health clinics, uh, and things like that. Socialist countries strive to provide universal health care for, for free at a, the point of delivery because it's the moral thing to do. It also helps to assure that everyone who is healthy and able to participate in work that needs to be done in a community for the community and helps in the building of a socialist society where helping one another and society in general is the norm and results in a better world for everybody, not just for capitalists or people who you know, own the banks or the businesses. Socialist healthcare is or should be based on scientific research, constantly evaluated and reevaluated for effectiveness and provided to all without regard to race, nationality, gender, or sexuality. The maternal mortality rate, the number of deaths per 100,000 live births is used by the World Health Organization as an indicator of how well a country is doing in providing health care in general. From 1995 until 2005, the maternal death rate declined. In other words, it approved worldwide by 44%, which that's pretty good news. Um, on the other hand, there are some countries that are just abysmal, doing abysmally. Um, uh, a 44% improvement is not that great. Uh, of the socialist countries, Cuba seems to have been the most, have, seems to have developed the most comprehensive system of healthcare delivery. Doctors are assigned geographic areas of responsibility. They provide health care to those who live in their assigned areas. In addition to caring for individuals, doctors follow trends in disease and disability and monitor the effectiveness of the care that's being given with the goal of eradicating disease and disability as much as possible. Everyone has a clinic nearby and a personal doctor. House calls are made to homebound patients. Medications and treatments are free. The blockade of Cuba has, of course, caused problems, but it has also forced an increase in innovation in the development of treatments and in modalities to cure and manage diseases. Cuba is in a position to provide for research and to develop new immunizations and methods of treating diseases and disability. Individuals from other countries travel to Cuba for surgery and treatments which are sometimes not available in their own countries or are of higher quality and cheaper for them. As for services specific to women, contraception is available and commonly used as is indicated by the small family size in Cuba. 
abortion is available if requested. At the same time, infertility treatment is now available. Perhaps more importantly, young people are educated regarding, re regarding reproduction and birth control. It is felt that decreased number of pregnancies among teens is a result of education. Pregnant women receive care and prenatal checkups in neighborhood clinics. They receive a supplemental diet and are monitored for gestational diabetes, anemia, all of the things that come, all of the complications that could come with pregnancy. Further, they attend consultations with a nutritionist, a dentist, a geneticist, and family psychologist. Doctors make home visits to observe domestic environments, provide advice, and familiarize themselves with potentially problematic economic or social situations. Women at risk for adequate weight, weight gain during pregnancy also can be admitted temporarily to a local maternity home, which provides inpatient care until the woman returns to a normal weight range. This is not necessarily a blueprint for the United States, but I think a lot of us could uh, really relate to the idea of having that kind of service when we're in our childbearing years. And we could also relate to that kind of service. Like uh, I can remember as a kid, house calls being made by doctors. They're a thing of the past. You, you have to get yourself to the hospital or the clinic either in a with your own transportation or by an ambulance. And um, a lot of things would depend on, as Bobby said, what we want in this country in the way of care, how we want to construct that care. And um, of course, there's the issue in this country of paying for health care. Nobody pays for your health care unless you have employer provided health care or if you can afford an insurance policy on your own. It's become just about impossible for anybody to pay for health care in this country. And many, many people are going without any form of uh, health care. And under the present administration, uh, it's going to even be difficult for as basic things like inoculations to take place. Um, I uh, checked out, in addition to Cuba, the situation in the public People's Republic of China, Vietnam, and Korea, they're all moving in the direction of a universal health care system. The achievement of a health care system that reaches all and takes into account the special health care needs of women is influenced by factors that existed prior to a socialist revolution, like war, famine, the degree of industrialization, uh, size and development of the working class, culture, previous experience with modern health care. Uh, that is access to medication, clinics, doctors, and hospitals, as well as uh, the misogyny and male supremacy that exist in the system. All of these affect the uh, willingness of uh, the society in being able to provide health care and for people to accept it. Uh, like I said before, uh, in the United States, it would be wonderful to think of being able to design our own healthcare system that really meets the needs of people of the way I think that socialist countries are trying to do, but there, there are obstacles to that. Um, I wanted to uh, note here too, that um, there are a lot of factors, like I've said before, there are a lot of factors that go into the pace of development of healthcare delivery system. Um, there are, uh, this development is influenced by economic, military, and ideological attacks by imperialist countries. Um, I found a table that uh, indicated where um, the maternal death rate and pregnancy outcomes per 100,000 births were influenced by the country being war-torn and fragile. In 1990, the uh, maternal death rate was 825. Luckily, by 2015, it had gone down to 488, but that's still unacceptable. In heavily indebted countries, it's gone from 957 to 482. And in least developed countries, it's the highest. It's 903, uh, gone down to 436. Um, 
The indebtedness of a country is very important to um, healthcare. Uh, and we know that war leads to inadequate or complete loss of shelter, water, food, and health care in many instances. Birth rate decreases and the maternal infant death rate increases. The development and production of weaponry take resources which could be used to provide the necessities of life, robbing people of a decent living. The production of nuclear weaponry follows the environment and their use can, be bring, can bring unfathomable death and destruction, even annihilation of the planet and all life. All countries have an interest in preventing war. And I think that the sooner that we can be involved in designing a healthcare system that benefits all people and takes all of this into consideration, it will really move uh, humanity forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. And before we open it to the uh, uh, to the uh, participants, uh, we'll hear for, from Rosanna. Good evening. Um, you know, as women, we experience many different types of pressures. From the minute we are born, we are pushing ourselves to be good enough because we are constantly told that we're not. Under socialism, that changes. A socialist system begins the process of establishing a society where people's needs are met equally. It means equitable access to childcare, education, affordable housing, food, and a livable wage. How many of us uh, do we wor How many of us worry about all those things? As women, we face uh, added pressures under capitalism that cause internal trauma. We are sent messages via so many avenues that we are not good enough. The clothes you wear, cover your face with makeup. Don't don't be too thin. Don't be too fat. Don't sit this way, stand this way. Don't play with this toy, uh, play with that one. You know, we all get, you can all get the picture now. And at a given moment, when we stand up to challenge that grain of thinking, we find ourselves swimming upriver and it's very stressful. We add the stress, we add that stress to the stress of everyday living under capitalism and we have a right to be tired, to feel tired. But we also must celebrate how we have risen and continue to swim up that river. Women cannot overcome certain barriers, especially emotional ones, without a society being part of bringing, without a society that, society being part of bringing down the conditions that create those barriers. I ask you to imagine that as a woman, you can choose a career, not based on how much money you make, but based on your interest. I ask you to imagine as a mother, you do not have to worry about the cost of safe and safety of childcare while you work. I ask you to imagine that you do not have to worry whether you will have enough money to buy your children's school clothes, supplies, and how to get them to the best schools. I ask you to imagine that you do not have to, you do not have to worry about whether you have enough money to pay the mortgage and or put food on the table. We live in a, this capitalist system, so for us it's difficult to imagine how we would really feel uh, not having to worry about these things. It sounds like a faraway dream, but we can remember a moment when we had some of that stress lifted. Remember how much more relaxed we felt. No matter how short that moment was, we know that it can exist and we long for it. I was, I was pleasantly surprised when I was in Venezuela in 2005. I visited a community when children, where children sang and danced for us at a courtyard in their neighborhood. It was really cute and, and I really enjoyed it. When the kids came to be reunited with their parents, primarily their mothers, I began to notice something that to this day I feel so fortunate to experience. First, I noticed the faces of the mothers they looked relaxed and they were smiling and present when, when their children came to, uh, to them to share whatever it was that they had in their mind, on their mind. This wasn't just one mother, but all the mothers uh, within my view. I was filled with hope. The children too seemed confident, not clingy uh, in an insecure way, not acting up for attention, but happy, eagerly sharing that moment with their mothers. 
I then remembered that prior to the children's performance, we had visited the food dispensary where the community could buy the food essentials for 60% less than the regular market price. We also visited the school where all the children could attend with uniforms, books, and good teachers, all provided by the government at no cost to the families. We visited the local medical clinic in the community where a dentist and a doctor were all 20, were on call 24 hours a day, also at no cost to the families. This is why the mothers look so relaxed and could focus on their children. I thought to myself, I have seen the beginnings of, socialist, of a socialist society, something that I had only read in books, but now I had witnessed it and it validated for me that I was fighting for something worth my time. I learned later that Venezuela also has established a pension fund for mothers who have stayed home and, take, to, uh, and have taken care of their children and their home, um, which really is uh, vital because it recognizes that their work at home is also valued. So socialism begins to eliminate the conflict of in, in the relations among people. It leads to cooperation and mutual assistance. The socialist state sets out to extend the re real realities for the working people to apply their, con their creative endeavors, abilities, and gifts. It is under these conditions that women can have complete equity in society. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Now we'll open the floor for uh, uh, comments and questions from the from the uh, participants from the audience. If you'd like to make a comment or introduce a question, please use your raised hand icon to, uh, and I will open your mic. Carol, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end. Carol, your mic is open. Please click, there you are. Okay, hi. Uh, first, let me thank the um, panelists for the reports. They were excellent, and I really enjoyed this webinar. I have a question that I guess could go to to uh, any of the three, but maybe because of the specifics of her report, maybe a Roberta more. And that is if you could say something about the role or the work of uh, women in unions under socialism. Uh, any changing, uh, the, is there a changing role for women in unions uh, under, under socialism uh, compared to uh, under capitalism? Um, I, could you repeat the first half of the question because it, I lost. Uh, it. Her question, her question is, is there a change of change for women when it comes to union being in unions? How does union being in a union affect women under capitalism versus under socialism? Well, I think that the, um, the main thing it would seem to me is that um, it's up to the women to, to, to make their role. You know, if they have the opening, then it's up to the women to see that, that the tools they have, which is the union, really, um, you know, speaks to their needs. Because, um, you know, some people wonder, why do you have a union if you have socialism? You know, everything should be fine. But there's always tensions and contradictions. Um, and I think that what the what um, the purpose of the union is to really make sure that the workers' needs are are respected or addressed, you know, within looking out for the good of society. So I would think that um, the role of, of women in, in unions would be similar to the to the role in a capitalist society in that it has to be a place where women can have a voice, but also where they can pull their energy and um, thinking, you know, and come up with some collective solutions to problems, but also to um, you know, to make proposals that might seem outlandish, but are really necessary. I know when you get a group of women together, just us three here, I, I'm hearing a lot of talk about, it seems that we are experiencing or observing the tremendous pressure on women's lives, not just 
economic, but time and, and those kind of things. And I think that that a union is a, is a tool for women, an organization where they can really address some of those issues and they have some power to do it because with the union, you have a, a workplace where people are, are there together um, and can actually carry out some solutions. I'd like to know what you think, Carol, though. <laughs> I, bet, I bet you have an idea on the subject. Carol, your mic is open if you'd like to. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I was thinking about, Roberta, the example you gave before where women, um, uh, when you went to Cuba in the 70s, women were um, asking for certain things that you and your group were surprised, like the beauty shop. And um, and I, I was also thinking the same thing. I know, I, I don't know if it's, this is still true, but I remember, I think in Cuba, like in the uh, late 70s, one of the things that um, I, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, there was through union negotiations and uh, you know union work. Women won a day, one day a month, to clean the house. And uh, interesting, but the the men didn't have this you know demand. So the women were uh, you know it it had to do with um, society in general that this was something that that they fought for and they won and you know they were given a paid day, they, you know, not to go to work and to stay home and do housework and things like that. Um, so I thought that was interesting, um, you know, what women ask for, but it was, it was granted. They weren't, um, they weren't fighting, uh, you know, for other rights that like basic rights, like health care and just a living wage. So they got creative and they were thinking of other things, you know, like you mentioned, that may seem a little strange, but um, this is one of the things that um, I, I found out about that they had won. Okay, if you'd like to m make a comment or introduce a question, please use your raised hand icon and we will open your mic. Irving, your mic is open. Please click your mic to open it on your end. There you are. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I guess my question is, is pretty much, first of all, I think um, I'd like to thank everybody that's participating in the uh, webinar. I think it was a wealth of information and well put together. Uh, but uh, my question's a, a little bit on along the lines of the last one, except for I wanted to know, um, will there be an expansion in the role of the leadership roles of women in socialist is socialism in socialist countries, uh, and how will that be achieved? The well, I think uh, I, I think definitely. I think uh, you know, as society begins to under socialism, we begin to shed all of these societal pressures, all of these societal um, things that you know uh, aspects that that. Put women in an, an in an inferior mode, and uh, also lift up women. You know, uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, when you don't have to worry about some of these basic kinds of needs. I think as women, we can focus on study, we can focus on leadership, we can focus on these things, and we can focus on um, demanding that leadership as well as pointing it out in a way that is constructive. Uh, I know that um, there is a, a great push among the Latin American countries in leadership where uh, for one rep male representative, there has to be a female representative. And that's something that's, that's throughout the, the Latin American countries that are establishing, that are attempting to establish some kind of social equity, so, socialist society, all of that kind of a thing. Um, that's one of the, the things that they focus on in order to bring women up, they, they, it has to be 50-50 in leadership and in any other kind of uh, form, uh, you know, um, leadership, I guess, leadership roles and stuff like that, representative roles, things like that. Sean, your mic is open. Hi, I just wonder uh, if any of the speakers could draw on their experience to, um, 
you know, in today's era of identity politics, you know, how to keep the intersectionality of it, you know, how to keep the focus of feminism as class struggle rather than, you know, I guess it can be, there's a joke online that instead of uh, protesting prisons, you just say, we need more female prison guards, you know, how to stay away from like that kind of, you know, I guess reactionary identity politics when talking about feminism. Could you, could you, Sean, define what you mean by identity politics? Uh, I, I guess, okay, I just mean like identity reductionism, you know, like how to keep the intersectionality in, you know, like feminism, like the fact that it does go back to like class struggle rather than, you know, specific, I don't know, I guess, um, I don't know, I guess more broader like identity issues. I don't know, it's, it's, I guess it's kind of hard for me to expand on. Like I just, you know, how to keep the intersectionality rather than falling back on, you know, like how to, yeah, intertwine class struggle with feminism. You know, if that makes sense, I guess. Thank you, Sean. Who would yeah. like to uh, go yeah, on? I, yeah, I, I, if I understand your question correctly, um, I have maybe an example that might be helpful. Uh, when I was in Venezuela, <clears throat> um, one of the things that really struck me was the fact that they also had, that those that were in prison were actually in rehabilitation. They were being taught skills, their self-esteem was being built up, um, their, the things that they created through, uh, you know, even just like carvings and things like that were, uh, were being sold and the, the money that they made, you know, um, that kind of a thing. So it began to build the human self into being part of the whole. And I think that uh, in a socialist society, that's what happens. You know, that you be all, all, everybody becomes part of that whole. You begin to see that cooperativeness. Uh, when I was in Cuba <clears throat> not too long ago, one of the things that struck me was everybody was very cooperative. You get on a bus, Everybody made sure that they made room for everyone else without any hesitation, helped anyone else who needed help getting in or out of the bus or, you know, when the bus made a sudden stop, all of these kinds of things. But there was a sense of cooperativeness that you didn't have to feel like you were not part of the entire society, your entire country. And so I think under socialism, it begins to tear up all of that, those things that have made you feel unequal, have made you feel a part of the entire group, you know, our working class, you know, our entire society. And I think uh, that, that that's one of the things that uh, socialism begins to tear down. That's if I understood your question, of course. Yeah, I can hop in here. Um, I uh, was thinking in terms of healthcare, uh, in a socialist United States, I think the first thing that we would uh, first uh, improvements in healthcare would go to the people who have the least health care, and that is uh, African American women, uh, uh, brown people, minorities in general, because that's where they are lacking health care the most. You know, bringing clinics into areas where they don't have clinics and uh, doctors, nurses. And I don't mean like we have now, like, a, you know, a, a community might get a grant for a, a clinic for a couple of years. And it's a uh, piecemeal approach. You know, they're scrabbling for every nickel and dime they can get. I mean, an approach that the healthcare is going to be improved, starting from uh, the least uh, served and work our way up because there's a, people in this society now, there are people who get the best care in the world, but we need to be sure that that care goes to uh, everybody. And like I said, that we, we start with the, uh, the least served people first. And I think um, also as the public schools improve and become more socialist uh, or, or are run by a socialist country, children will be growing up and into a no. ideology that um, that is a humanist ideology. Um, 
like to can, let me jump in with a thought because I, Sean, I don't see it as this, the big problem you do <laughs> seem to. Um, you know, um, I think that um, we're, of course, the fundamental issue is the class struggle, you know, and we're fighting capitalism. Uh, the vast majority of people in this country are working class, the vast majority of, you know, of women are working class. And so the things that we're fighting for, for their equality, whether you call it feminism or something else, um, isn't, is, is in their interest. And some of the issues that are seen as not, you know, as identity politics, I think also impact those women because when working class women, when women who are rich women or whatever are treated disrespectfully and venom is heaped on them in the public arena, then I think that that pours over onto all of us women and, you know, creates a situation where we're devalued. So we, and it oppresses us. And so we all have an interest in, in those kind of issues. So I think every, I, I, I'm trying to, I'm struggling to think of an issue of, you know, that, that, that relates to women's equality that we wouldn't be supportive of or that, you know, objectively isn't anti-capitalist, even if the people, maybe it's not high on my priority list, as Diane said, you know, we're prioritizing the needs of, of working class women and women who are, you know, have the most problems. But I think that it's, it, it's not helpful. I don't see it helpful to kind of draw a line, um, you know, between uh, working class women and, and other women or say that, other people's problems aren't relevant to us. Aloha, Roberta. Aloha, Rosanna. Aloha, Diane. This is Lowell calling from, uh, or speaking to you from Hawaii. Um, hi, Lowell. Hi, aloha. Um, I'm glad you answered Sean's question because I was going to jump in with something with that and I still might. Um, like I told Jarvis in an earlier webinar, um, I hope this is part one of this socialism and women series because um, there was a lot of um, really nice uh, aspirations for where we need to get to. Um, I really want us to remember that there are women um, if you will, in the first, second, and third wave, third waves of feminism, who have fought very communist women, um, who have fought very militantly um, for um, what it is we are talking about, and I think it's important for us to recognize and be familiar with the work that they did. I'm thinking, for example. We should know of, I'm just learning about Rose Pastor Stokes. So I'm just beginning to get into, um, and I can't, I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm just beginning to, uh, I just read about her. So hopefully that's a proper name to mention. Definitely Margaret Sanger, who was a Socialist Party member and who was controversial, but I think has been rehabilitated by a current Marxist scholar who I'm going to mention, and uh, someone like Sylvia Pankhurst, who was so um militant if you will um that she was thrown out of various organizations but sylvia federici who is a current marxist scholar in i think new york who has rehabilitated it uh margaret sanger um who was a socialist um who um was an organizer before she started planned parenthood um selma james who spoke about women and work and not just work in the factories and work in the workplace but work domestically and, and that kind of um those issues and then Jermaine greer um is a name we often um overlook but uh these are people who either in the literature um and or in the streets and organizing have been fighting for some of the things that i think have come up definitely in the question like how do we do this what does it look like um i think they leave a rich literature for us for our party to be much more familiar with 
Um, and I think Cuba was mentioned a few times. And whenever you think of Cuba, whenever I think of Cuba and women's issues and definitely gay issues, I think of the present president's um, wife, Vilma Espin, who's now deceased. But Vilma Espin started the Federation of Cuban Women. She introduced the decriminalization of lesbians and gays in the uh, Cuban parliament in the 70s. She failed the first time, kept fighting for it, passed the second time in 1980. Um, again, these are women, that communist women, I keep emphasizing that, these are communist women who have leave us a literature and examples of the work that they've done. And we, we need to be much more familiar with their work. Thank you. Yeah, I, if I could make a quick comment about that. I think I think more than anything, it tells us that we didn't get here alone, you know, or all, all, all on our own kind of a thing. And I think it tells us that, and it reminds us that uh, the struggle is a process. It's a step-by-step -step process. You know, I, I, I uh, when we have women's uh, gatherings here, you know, I kind of use the example of, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here if it hadn't been for other women who fought for our right to sit here. And that our responsibility is to move that struggle forward. And I remind my daughter that her responsibility is to move it even further than what my generation has been able to move it forward to. So I think in studying some of these women, um, I think we, we need to, uh, you know, always remember that, you know, nothing, is hap nothing happens in isolation and we don't get here by ourselves. Uh, hello, this is Emil. Yes, yeah, you're Mike. I, yes, thank you. I just have a tiny statistic for you. I pulled up the results of the recent parliamentary elections in Cuba while you were speaking. And the results are that 53.22% of the women in the Cuban uh, People's Power National Assembly are women, uh, uh, are the members. And this is the second highest in the world I don't know why uh, Rwanda is first with 61.30%. Uh, but after Cuba comes Bolivia with 53.10% and Nicaragua with 45.7%. So the political power equations uh, are changing in countries that are socialist like Cuba and in countries where the governing groups have a socialist uh, orientation like Nicaragua and uh, Bolivia. That's all. Thank you. Yes, I want to just a personal note there. Uh, since the Women's March last year, I have to say every time I look at a picture that like a boardroom of all men, a cabinet of all men, a Congress of all men, I can't help thinking that no wonder we have so many problems. If there were some women there, maybe it would have changed things, especially working class women. But I think all women are oppressed in some way. And uh, just adding uh, more women in the mix uh, would really help. And I really appreciate those statistics, Emma. Hello? Yeah, I had a question for any three of you or all three of you. I was just wondering if um, did, when uh, under the socialist systems that you guys are referring to, traditional gender roles in occupations like nursing and teaching or in uh, home care roles, caring for the elderly or for children, look any different for women under socialism? Well, I, I, when I was in Cuba, one of the things that, you know, one of the, we asked actually that question and pretty much women are, are able to enter any kind of field they want to enter. 
Um, surprisingly, they don't choose to enter into any field that's about uh, transportation, you know, like driving buses or taxis and things like that. But that was based on their choice, not based on them uh, being moved in that direction or away from that from that uh, skill. But they could pretty much be, you know, whatever they their interest was. And if they studied for that and they they uh, went into a job with that field and realize they didn't like it, you know, and, and this goes for both uh, um, genders. Um, they they could go back to school and study something else and be guaranteed a job on, in that field. So um, I don't think that in other countries are they're moving in, in, you know, doing any kind of traditional roles. I think it's more of a choice of what you want to do or what's available. Of course, you know, different countries are on different levels of development. So we have to take that into consideration when we when we um, talk about that or when we, you know, analyze it. Okay, we're at the point now where we can uh, begin to summarize. So what I would suggest, unless someone wants to uh, we do have one more uh, question or comment. Shelby, your mic is open. Yeah, uh, I like the reports, uh, all that I heard. I had to walk out for a while, so maybe somebody has uh, spoke to this question anyway. Uh, but, I, but I was wondering with uh, all the uh, excitement and attention that women are given to issues uh, now in terms of uh, sexual harassment and uh, inequality in pay and et cetera, and et cetera. Do we think that um, uh, it might be a time to try to integrate the whole notion or concept more of socialism uh, and what socialism provides uh, integrated with all the other action, activity, and, and, and motion that's in place now. Um, so that's my question. Anybody want to take it? <laughs> um, I, I think we're appropriate, yes, definitely. I think we need to begin to talk about that there is something better out there, and we need to point it out, you know, not in a, not in a, um, uh, dogmatic way or, or an inappropriate way, but, you know, in conversation and in, in discussions, uh, you know, I think we do need to, we, we do need to bring it forward. We do need to help people understand that there is hope. I mean, that's why I joined the party, because when I learned that there is another society possible, I said, I'm in. And then when I saw it in Venezuela, as I mentioned, I said, I'm definitely staying. So... You know, I think that, yeah, wherever appropriate, I think we shouldn't hesitate. We shouldn't hesitate at all. I, I personally find, you know, in small groups of women, women easy to bring up the idea that there's a better way of doing things. Because I think at the back or even at the front of most women's mind, they, they know there's a better way to do things. And uh, they're welcoming of the idea. Oh, they're muted me. Let's see. Edward, your mic is open. Hi, Eddie Carson from the Boston Club. I appreciate the um, the reports from all three of you. I was spending some time the other day looking at um, the states that are really looking to reduce Medicaid expansion. And in this question, uh, Diane, I've directed at you, but it's open for um, for any of, uh, of you three. So. It's Edward, Edward, we can't hear you. Edward, we can't hear you. We've lost your sound, Edward. Your mic is still open, but we've lost your sound. We still don't hear you. Okay, it says Edward is offline now. Oh. 
Okay. So what I would suggest we do is uh, we go, uh, we're a uh, little at, we're at the end. I would suggest that we allow each person to give a uh, summary uh, remarks uh, briefly, and then we'll, we'll call it a night. So we'll start, let's start with Rosanna. Well, I don't really have any way of summary. I think, you know, um, I think we kind of pretty much said it all. I think, you know, we, we have a bright future as long as we fight for a change in this, you know, in the system and, um, you know, look for strength um, with, among each other and look for strength on the women that came before us and look for strength on the women that are coming after us because there's a lot of good, strong women that are, are uh, they're in the movement. So, you know, I think we just need to really build that sisterhood that, that is so badly needed sometimes where it keeps us from, from joining together. Um, so that's it. Roberta? Yeah, um, well, I've enjoyed this conversation. Um, I guess, um, I think that um, Shelby asked the question about addressing issues like harassment and inequality and pay. And I, I guess in the past, when I've heard discussions about women and socialism, it's always been a, a sort of a list of the benefits that women and families could have in a socialist society, you know, whether it's childcare, equal pay, and so on. But I think um, maybe a deeper question, and I think in, in possibly in socialist countries, there have been issues of, of sexual harassment and other unequal, unequal conditions because um, most countries where there's socialism have uh, have come from uh, where there was a deeply patriarchal um, society preceding that and and not as as long of a history of and um, of women's uh, organization and struggle. So I think what we need to think about about women and socialism is in addition to the specific benefits that we you know think we would all agree on that. It, actually, it would be us getting to make those decisions and choices and making the changes and, and that together we would have to decide what those are. So in my case, um, the question of being able to go into a, a non-traditional job, you know, is very important, or the, you know, to have that opening or the question of being able to work. But for other women, maybe who's background was they had to work and they wanted to stay home with their children, that those options would be there too, that, that those would be the kind of things that people, you know, that society and women could decide was important and, and were, were open. You know, um, there was a movie um, put out um, called What Women Want. I don't know if any of you had the misfortune to see it starring Mel Gibson. <laughs> just to think, anyway, I just bring that up to say, you know, everybody who says what women want is not really speaking for what women want. Um, there's not a blueprint. Uh, I think that the basic thing is that socialism would give us the opportunity to together make those decisions about what we want and how we can bring it about. And it's not to say that every woman has to, you know, has to be a construction worker or every woman has to be a daycare worker or every woman has to work, but that we have the freedom a lot, you know, and fighting for the freedom of women to make these uh, kinds of choices or to be an artist, you know, is also inherently fights for the freedom of men to make those kind of choices. I found that that work is, is a huge part of everybody's life. It, it gives our lives value, but for women, we're not encouraged to feel that way, to think that it's a central part of it. We're encouraged to feel that it's sort of a side thing. And I think that um, one of the things women might decide is to really elevate the role of work in our lives, the values that we get from our friendships and, and relationships at work. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you ready for me? Yes. I, I, I know women, you know, I, I probably can name a 
dozen or two women that I would feel confident right now of them designing a healthcare system for women, you know, free at the point of uh, service and comprehensive and um, uh, would, would admit anybody into the professions that really wants to be in those professions, that wants to be a helping person. Um, I'm a nurse, so um, I'm very proud to be a nurse. I'm glad to be able to work among women, frankly, um, but I welcome men to come into the profession too. Um, I'm drawing a lot of confidence right now from the teachers who walked out in West Virginia, uh, from the, the students that are speaking up to save their lives so that they can get an education, come home from school alive at the end of the day. And I think there are a lot of people in motion that their heads are in the right place, they're moving in the right direction, and they have, you know, a, a vision ahead of them of uh, the way society should be. And I would like to help to nurture that vision and bring it to fruition. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for participating tonight. Uh, the panelists especially, thank you. We had a little bit of difficulty at the beginning, but we got through and we've completed our, our assignment uh, very well. And I'd like to thank all of the participants for, for coming on tonight. Over 150 people uh, signed up for this webinar, so they will all receive the recording. So thank you again. Uh, um, there are webinars uh, coming uh, in April, so please stay tuned. Good night, everyone.